thank you, Madonna, for that beautiful song. You are the one that we praise, hallelujah. You are the one that we adore. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? It's a special Sabbath today. We are uh, in worship. We are praising the King of Kings. And today's word is to serve the King. To serve the King. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you that as we come into this place, God, we can experience your grace and mercy towards us with other believers. We come into this room because we believe that we are not sufficient, because we need help, and because, God, we have fallen short of your ideal, but yet you see us as sinners, not to cast away, but to save. So, Lord, we're grateful today, and, Lord, you give us a challenge, you give us a calling to serve you. May we respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Two Saturdays ago, many of you probably watched or watched later on the crowning of King Charles III at Westminster Abbey in England, there in London. And this coronation of this king was something out of like the Middle Ages. These were rituals that were passed down for so many centuries. And King Charles was given an orb, symbolized the world, the globe was in his hand. He was also given a sword. He was given a scepter. And on his head was put a crown of solid gold with many jewels as well, that was 360 years old. St. Edward's crown was placed on top of his head as he sat on an oak chair that was 700 years old. I will probably be a little, weird, a little worried that the chair might break. <laughs> 700 years old tradition, the crowning of a king. And in front of world leaders, other royals, dignitaries, other stars. The new monarch of England declared, I come not to be served, but to serve. He then took the coronation oath and became the first monarch in history to pray aloud at his coronation. But, as I saw the pictures and it was all over the news, I wish that King Charles III would remember what happened in England in the year 1014. In the year 1014, over England ruled a Danish king, and his name was Canute. And here Canute, he was on the throne of England, and he looked at all of everything that he had, and he saw the people sitting at his court. And every day he would get up, he would sit on his throne, and everyone in the throne would say, around his throne would say, you're such a great king. Nothing can stand against you, king. You're the greatest king to ever exist. How wonderful you are. And every time he had a plan for something, they'll say, yes, for it is the greatest plan ever. And every time he said, well, what if we solve it this way? Yes! You are the greatest king of all time. And after a while, it's like if you have syrup and pancakes every single day for breakfast. <laughs> At first, you like it. You don't miss the fruit. But then after a while, you get sick and tired of it, of the sweetness. And he got tired of it. He got tired of the fake praise. So what he did was, he took his throne and he ordered the people to take his throne and put it on the seashore. And there on the seashore, he sat down and he claimed to the waters, he said, waves, stop before you touch my throne. And he proclaimed it and the people clapped, but the waves did not listen. And the waves came. 
and came and one and, and minute by minute was getting closer and closer to his chair, closer and closer to his throne. Finally, it started touching his toes. Waves, I told you to stop. The waves kept coming. And ultimately, the king got very wet. And at the end of that day, what the king did was that he took off his crown and he went to a cross in a church and he put the crown on the cross for Jesus is the only king that the winds and the waves obey. He's the king above all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. And today, we're going to speak about this king of kings. Not only do, his, do we, should we pledge allegiance to him, but the king has a perfect law, and his law should be written in our hearts. The king wants obedience. The king, the king wants us to serve him in love. That's why today we're going to talk on how to serve the king of kings. We're going to talk about the way to serve the king of kings. Very popular in English culture when the king is coming by. Throughout history, they have said this expression. And I think my clicker got stuck here. They have said this expression. Make way for the... Look at the person next to you and tell them, make way. Make way. Get out of the way. Make way for the king. Make way for the king. When the king will come in, in his chariots, make way for the king. Make way for the king. And all the townspeople will move. Matter of fact, this term, make way for the king, it's a biblical term. It actually comes from Psalms. It's when David is writing. He's saying, doors, doors of the city gates, make way. Open up for the king is going to come in to be with his people. Open up. But the expression, make way for the king, actually, even though it's a biblical reference, it got very popular in Greek culture, in a Greek tra tragedy, Greek mythology. And the story goes that once there was a chariot, and the, horse, uh, and the horseman that was riding this chariot sees a, a boy walking on the street. And he says, make way for the king, make way for the king. And this young man that's walking on the street sees the chariot and sees the horses. And he says, me, move. <laughs> I will never move. Make way for the king. Make way for the king. And this man did not move. This young boy did not move. And what happened is that the horseman could not stop the horses. And the horses managed to hit this young man and hurt him. And blood is coming out of his of his of his body that has been injured. And what he does is, finally, when the horse stops, he goes and fights inside the chariot and kills the person riding inside the chariot. It turns out that it was the king. It turns out that it was his father. According to this tragedy, he just didn't know it. If he just would have made way for the king, if he just would not have been in the way of the king, we need to make way for the king. Look how the Bible tells us that we need to do this. John chapter 11, verse 38 to 39. Jesus once more was deeply moved. You see, Jesus was moved because Jesus' one of Jesus' best friends was dead. Jesus was in another town teaching and preaching. Jesus gets the word that he is very sick. He is about to die. But Jesus continues his mission, and finally his friend dies. And look what happens here. Jesus, once more, he was deeply moved. He was at a funeral service. His friend had died. And this is what, this is what happened. Jesus came to the tomb of his friend. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. And Jesus, he sees the stone on, in front of the cave, and Jesus tells the people there, hey, Take this way the stone, he said. Move it. That stone where my friend lays, move it. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a what? Bad odor. For he has been there how many days? He, ha he has been there four days. You see, in this story, Martha gets in the way of the king. She gets in the way of resurrection power. Jesus is about to do a great miracle before the people, and then there is Martha who gets in the way and says, no, no, hold up, stop. 
He thinks he has been dead, God. He has been dead, Jesus. Don't, don't stop what is happening here. Martha gets in the way of Jesus performing his miracle. You see, this is not nothing new. You see, when the Lord is about to do a work, Satan moves upon someone to object. Satan moves to stop what God is about to do. When God is going to do something great, when there's a pouring of the Holy Spirit, when God is going to move his people forward, when the church is going to grow, when there's going to be an outpouring, what happens is there's people that may be rational, they have good intentions, they, they, they know the people in the church, but Satan moves upon them to object. Satan moves upon them to stop the move of God. She, Martha, was unwilling that the decomposing body should be brought to view. The human heart is slow to understand Christ's words, and Martha's faith had not been grasped, had not grasped the true meaning of his promise. God's about to do something great. Make way for the king. Make way for the king. Get out of the way. Let God do what God's going to do. But there's people that are well-intentioned, people that are very rational, that get in the way. And when they get in the way, it is because God is going to do something great and Satan has moved upon them to object. But there's not enough money. That will never work. Think. Decompose. You see, she did not want the people to see the body of her dead brother. But what she did not see is what God was about to do. She got in the way. But there's the heralds, there's the trumpets, there's, there's the noise that is calling from heaven, make way for the king. There's a few reasons why we get in the way of what God is about to do. I want to share with you three reasons. The first one is that the past, what? Surpasses passion for the what? The past surpasses passion for the future. You see, there's so many people, when they look back after, you know, God has done what God wanted to do, they look back and they say, oh, yes, I, I knew that was going to happen. You ever had those people when you watch a movie and then the movie at the end has a plot twist and then at the end of the movie they say, I knew it. <laughs> and you're like, you were wrong the first 45 minutes of this whole thing. You know, hindsight, the expression is a hindsight is always what? 2020. Hindsight, when you look back on it, you're like, of course, look, God moved. Look, God, God did it. Of course he did it. Of course he moved. But when you're in it, the moment that God is about to move, the moment that God is going to do something great, we bring so many objections to him because the past at times surpasses the passion for the future. We get mad when things don't go our way. We get so caught up in our own thinking that we don't listen to God's new orders. If God worked in the past, why would he stop working now? You see, there is a hermit crab in the ocean. And what it does is that it looks for a shell to fit in. And he lives in that shell. It lives in that shell until it outgrows it. There's a point that it no longer could be in that shell, so it needs to move, and it needs to grow, and it needs to go in the ocean floor and find a bigger shell. It, needs to com it does this process over and over throughout its whole lifetime. It's in one shell, but then it begs to grow, and it needs to leave that shell and go to the next shell. And then it grows again, and then it needs to go to the next shell. And it, it goes from victory to victory, from glory to glory. It continues to grow more and more and more. See, the problem is that we are unlike this hermit crab. We like to cling to something that no longer fits because it's easy and familiar. Because we're so used to it, because it's so comfortable. But you see, God did not call us to be comfortable. God did not call us for the familiar. The Bible explains that the work of sanctification is a work of a lifetime. This means that when you get baptized, that is not when God has completed his work. You see, God is working on you and God is working in me day by day. And day by day, we need to be growing in the kingdom of God. You see, this does not mean that something God did before and I just think about that my whole life. No, God also has something planned for me in the future. 
And I need to continue walking in faith, trusting God every day, because God is making me more like him every single day. You see, the Christian life is about growing. It's not about being stagnant or about declining. It's about growing in what God has for us. And here Martha, she is so comfortable. She's so comfortable seeing the stone before the grave. She's so comfortable because anytime she thinks about Lazarus, she can go to this grave and bring her flowers and, and just rest there. Oh, that's where Lazarus is. So comfortable, but not growing, not growing. You see, the past, her past, her passion for the future, the past, her memories with Lazarus were greater than what God could do with Lazarus in that moment in her mind. She did not continue to grow. You know, imagine that for your anniversary, you told your wife that you had such a great time last year with what you guys did that you decided not to do something this year. <laughs> hey, babe, remember last year we went on that cruise for our anniversary? Wasn't it so great? Remember that this year. <laughs> We're staying inside. <laughs> Doesn't work. But why do we treat God that way? God, you did so many great things in the past. God, you led our church. You don't even know the history of this church. We started in the learning center. And the Lord blessed it. And then the fellowship hall was built. The Lord blessed it. And then the sanctuary was built. And the Lord blessed it. But because the Lord blessed does not mean that God has stopped blessing. It doesn't mean that God has stopped pouring out his plans for us. It doesn't mean that we have accomplished what God wants us to accomplish. God wants us to walk out in faith. And here what we see is that the past cannot surpass the passion that God has for the future for us. Another reason why we get in the way of the king is because we value what? Our way over whose way? And you will hear this expression a lot. We've never done it that way before. We've never done it that way before. I've never seen another Adventist church do it that way. When you do something that's following God's plan, everyone loses their mind. <laughs> you see, Martha, what happens is Martha had heard of Jesus resurrecting Jairus' daughter right after she died. Oh, yeah, Jesus, we heard that you resurrected her right away after you were a little late. She died and you resurrected her. We heard of that. We heard that the widow's son died, and while he was being carried out, you stopped the progression and, and, and brought him back to life. But we've never seen it done that after four days, someone has been raised. We've never seen it done. We've never done it that way before. But you see, God does not need your authorization or your permission for him to work. We've never seen it done that way, but you don't know what God has planned to do it. You have no idea how God has planned. You can't limit God. You know, there was a Henry Ford once said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. But you see, Henry Ford decided not to give people what they wanted, but what they didn't even know they needed. Cars. We've never seen it done that way before. You know, we need to stop saying that we've never done it that way before and start asking God to show us what way he wants us to do it. It was once a couple, they went out to dinner. It was the girl's birthday. And when they get there to the restaurant and they're, you know, they're so happy, they're dating, it's love. The boyfriend comes to the dinner with a big box. A beautiful box, has a lace around the box, a nice bowl, beautiful colors. And he puts it on the table in front of the girl. And she's like, oh, baby, thank you. She's about to open it. He's like, no, 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 stop, 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 no, no. Only after dinner can you open it. So they get the, they get the appetizer. And she's looking at the box. She's like, what's in the box? Don't worry about it. When we're done eating, you can open the box. She's eating her salad. She's looking at the box. Oh, I wonder what it is. <laughs> then the entree comes out. She gets the entree. She's looking at the food, but she also has another eye on the box. <laughs> she begins to eat the, the entree really fast. 
Baby, can I open the box? No, 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 when the box, you open the box when we're done eating. All right. The waiter comes. Do any of you guys want dessert? It's a special occasion. No, no, no dessert, says the girl. No. <laughs> I want to open the box. <laughs> Finally, she looks at him. She's like, are you done? You're done eating? Okay, great. Can I open the box? He's like, you can open the box. And she looks like the ribbon, and she pulls it, and it opens the box. And all of a sudden, she sees a pillow. You made me wait for a pillow. Yeah, you don't like the pillow? I mean, it, I mean, it's my birthday, and you got me a pillow. <laughs> Disappointment came all over her face. Then the boyfriend took the pillow, and she's like, hold on, let me see that pillow. She, took, she takes it, and she turns it around expecting an envelope. Nothing. <laughs> she takes your pillow. She takes the pillow. She throws it on the floor. She gets on one knee and pulls out the ring. Will you marry me? You see, she did it in a way she did not expect. We have never done it that way before. I've never seen it that way before. But don't tell God the way he needs to do things. God has his way of doing something. God has his way of making us grow. The people compared, uh, co complained to Noah, Noah, <laughs> we've never seen it rain before. So they didn't get in the ark. Moses, we have never gone this way before. But God split the Red Sea. Joshua. We have never been an army of that size in a city with walls that big like Jericho. But God brings down the wall and everyone in it. David, you're crazy. We have never fought against a, a giant like Goliath before. But God uses a sling and a stone to bring him down. You see, God doesn't need human authorization, human methods, human logic, or human ideas to make a way. You see, we've never done it that way before, but God will do it his way. And God's way needs to become our way. God's way needs to become our way. I think that's one, too. Dana, if you can bring it a little bit, a little louder here. God's way needs to become my way. God's way needs to become our way. So, God, if you want us to build an ark, we will. God, if you want us to walk the Red Sea, we will. God, if you want us to shout so that Jericho's walls will fall, we will. God, if you want us to grab five smooth stones, we will. God, if you want us to walk into Nebuchadnezzar's hot furnace, we will. God, if you want us to praise in the lion's den, we will. God, if you want us to fast in the king's palace like Esther, we will. God, if you want us to preach to Nineveh, we will. God, if you want us to baptize the Gentiles, we will. We've never done it that way before, but God, if you have your way, then God, your way needs to become way. Make way for the king. Make way for the king. His way needs to become my way. Another reason why we get in the way of God is because moving is too hard. Moving is too hard because the small things become big. You know, there's some churches that split because there's going to be teas at the potluck. There's some churches that take 10 years to choose the carpet color. There's some churches that when they get in the way of what God is trying to do, the small things become big things. And the reason for this is because a psychologist said that all change is lost. All change is lost. You see, the moment that Jesus told the people there, move the stone. For Martha... She was experimenting loss. She was experimenting the stone moving, experimented her again losing her brother one more time. Experimented loss. That is why it's so hard for churches to change even when change is necessary because there's a loss of culture even if that culture is dysfunction. But you see, the reality is we cannot use the Holy Spirit. We have to let the Holy Spirit use us. 
have to let the Holy Spirit use us. You know, a wild stallion. When it's wild, then it needs to be broken. What it hates is to have a cowboy get on top of it to steal it. It doesn't mind that the farmer gives it food. It doesn't mind that the farmer gives it water. It doesn't mind that the farmer, when it rains, gives it a shed or, or, or a house so it can go in and not get wet. But it does mind getting broken, being steered. In the same way, we say, God, bless me with food. God, bless me with a job. God, bless my church. But the moment that God wants to break things in us, the moment that God wants to move things, we say, God, no, no, no. And the only way that God can give you direction in your life is when God is writing and telling you where to go. But like Martha, we say, no, don't move the stone. Don't move it. It's lost for me. And the truth is that when you let God in your life, you experience loss, and it's the loss of you controlling your life. You begin now to be in sync with God's plan when God's way becomes your way. When the king will arrive into town, the soldiers will cry out, make way for the king, make way for the king. Martha got in the way, but the gospel is telling us, be aligned with God and don't get in the way. Not only would soldiers say, make way for the king, they also have another expression, and it's this one, for king and what? For king and country, for king and country. This expression for king and country appeared in William Shakespeare's play, Henry IV, and also it comes from the Romans, which is for God, home, and country. In America, we have another expression. It's not for king and country. It's for God and country because we don't have a king. But the real expression is for God and country. And what this is telling us is that we need to serve the king, not just serve him, but also our fellow countrymen our fellow people. And look what happened in the text here. John 11, verse 38 to 39. And it says, Jesus once more was deeply moved and came to the tomb. And it was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. So they took away the stone. When you begin to align yourself with the king, you need to start obeying the orders of the king. And if this is what happens, that Jesus begins to tell the people, he said, take away the stone. And what happens is when you begin to obey the king, you begin to follow the king. And what happens is that they listen. So they took the stone, what? Away. They took the stone away. I love this text. Because it doesn't tell you who did it. It's anonymous. And they took the stone away. When you begin to serve God, it's less about you and more about him. There's some people that are famous on earth and not well known in heaven. But I want to be well known in heaven and not popular on earth. I want Jesus to be popular on earth. And when you begin to work for the king, you're not after notoriety. You're not after pulpits. You're not after being on top of a stage. You're not after being famous. You're after Jesus being famous. And here what happens is Jesus is the one that gets all the glory. Their names are not even mentioned. The New York Yankees, my favorite baseball team, the only team in baseball that on their backs, they don't have the names of the players. They only have the number. So that the players don't play for the names, they play for the team. And when we come to church, we're not playing for the players, we're playing for the kingdom of God. We're not playing for how I feel or for how you feel. We're praying that the kingdom of God grows. So when someone comes into the church, when someone comes into God's house, I don't see what they are. I see what the king can do in them. I don't see how they came in. I can see what God can transform in them. I don't play for my name. I pray for his name. I don't pray for that my will be done. I pray that God's will be done. I work for king and country. Something else happens. When you serve the king, you obey the king's orders. Move the stone. But it's for king and country. 
the people around. Take away the stone, he said. So they took away the stone. You see, Jesus could have commanded the stone to move by itself. He had the power to move the stone. But Jesus likes to involve sinners like you and me in the process of salvation. Jesus likes to involve you and I in the process of raising the spiritually dead. You see, Christ is able to save souls with our help, but he, without our help, but he doesn't. He wants us to be involved. He wants us to care for others. You see, this is what the spirit of prophecy tells us. More happened. Oh, the Bible tells us here. Move the stone. They have a part to play. They move the stone. Look what happened next. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with stripes of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, what? Take off the grave clothes and what? Jesus could have done it. Jesus could have taken off the clothes. Jesus could have taken off all the, the linen. But the reason he does it is to show that even though God is the one that brings salvation and raises the spiritually dead, we need one another. We need to serve God, we need to serve king, and also we need to serve country. You see, God could have chose angels who had never fallen to do the work that we need to do, but he chose human beings to go and also help seek and save the lost. You see, what you and I can do, God will not do for us. We need to go out and we need to go find people that God has already been working in. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy says it this way. Those who have experienced the love of Christ cannot be idle, idlers in the master's vineyard. They will see opportunities for helping others in their steps to Christ. Partaking of Christ's love, they will labor for the souls of others. Every soul copy the pattern and become missionaries in the highest sense, winning souls to Jesus. Jesus could have moved the stone, but he says, no, you move it. You move it. Go, move the stone. I'm going, to I'm going to rise up the spiritually dead. But I need you, church. I need you, neighbor. I need you, friend. Even though they have been freed, I need you to take off and help them grow. I need you to take off the bandages that are binding them. I need you to be there. I need you to touch them. I need you to grab them. I need you to hold them. I need you to hug them. When they come out, when I have resurrected them, when I have given them a new life, I need you to be there. But unfortunately, there are times and God tells us to move the stone, and we like to put it in the stone. And God says, hey, I'm going to do a resurrection power in that person. Move the stone. Let's go. And we like to put the stone back. And God raises those people, brings them to the church, and God has been working. God has been reviving them. And God says, now, church, it's our job to help them grow, take off the bandages, and we like to put the bandages back on. Oh, you don't practice health methods yet. Oh, you don't understand the 2300 days yet? Woo! Got a long way to go, buddy. We put bandages on people when God is saying, look, I'm doing the resurrection work. You, know, you don't have that power. I'm going to do the work. We need to serve king, and we also need to serve country countrymen. We need to serve the people that God is forming and bringing to the kingdom of God. We need to go become soul winners. We need to become missionaries in our neighborhoods. What are you doing in your neighborhood to roll away the stones? What are you doing to make sure the stones are being rolled away? Make way for the king. Serve king and country. There's another expression that I heard at the coronation, and they sang even a song, and there was a long shout at the end of the song that said this, long live the what? Long live the king. Lazarus has been resurrected. The people that were there were in charge of moving the stones, taking off the linen. There's a revival and awakening. And now Lazarus has a story to tell. 
long live the king. John chapter 12, verse 9 through 11. And when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see whom? Whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to what? As well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in. You see, the plan was not only to kill Jesus. The plan was to kill also. Because if you can shut up God's people from testifying what God has done in their lives, then you will not have a changed community. But Lazarus, who had been revived, Lazarus, who had been resurrected, Lazarus begins to go in his community, community, begins to tell the people, look what God has done in me. I was dead, and now I'm alive. And the people were being transformed, were following Jesus because of the testimony of Lazarus. And now the plan is the satanic plan, the demonic plan, is we not only have to kill Jesus, we have to shut up Lazarus. The reason why our, church, our churches don't grow is because the testimonies have been shut up. It's not that God hasn't been moving. It's that the testimony has been gone quiet. The testimony has gone silent. And people are not sharing what God has done. You know, in the year 300, Christians were being persecuted. There was a man named George. And he believed so much in Jesus in a pagan Roman culture that when they wanted to worship all these false gods, he stood up in the city square where he had to say that he would worship these gods, and he says, I will worship none of these gods. I will only worship God alone, the creator of heaven and earth that died for me. And the story goes that they took this George, and they beheaded him. And because of his story, so many people converted. How can someone who was so decided, really believed in the cause, cost him his life, but it brought so many people into the kingdom. You see, the kids, they would hear the stories, and the parents didn't want their kids to know what had really happened, so they made a myth about him. And the myth was that in the city, this Roman town, that there was a dragon, and the dragon was really evil, and Every year, he would want the people to pay tribute to him, and they would have to offer up animals to him. And then the animals started to run out, so they would offer children. And then they would cast lots to the city to see to feed this dragon. And finally, one day, they cast the lots, and the one that needs to be sacrificed to this dragon is the princess, the king's daughter. And she's going to die, but George a knight, comes in a white horse and sees that the princess is going to die. And George takes out his sword and fights against the dragon and kills the dragon and saves the princess. Sounds familiar from Disney, maybe? They got it from this story. And what was written in the history book of this myth, it was to show parents, uh, kids, in a different way, how George, who never was a knight, who did not have a horse, who did not even have a sword, this Christian martyr who, riding on the wings of the gospel, encountered the demonic spirit in his city, and even though he died, he was a victor in Christ, and he was able to liberate the people so that they can worship the true God. That's the story that they tell, and that's the story that is actually in many churches today. You can see the plaque of this hero. God never said it would be easy. The devil's plan is not only to stop Jesus being pronounced, to stop the testimony from being told. 
it stopped the story of you and I from being told. And you see, the problem is you and I don't like people to know where God has taken us from. We like to be silent in our testimony because it's very dirty. Because if we were to stand here today and say, let me tell you where I was and let me tell you how God had liberated me, it will impact so many lives because so many people are going through the things that you and I have gone through. It's not that the devil just wanted to kill Jesus. No, we got to stop the testimony. Because when Jesus ascends, all we have is a testimony. That's why the Bible says in the book of Revelation, and they will overcome by the blood of whom? The lamb and the word of whom? Their testimony. I don't know how many of you the devil has set up. He says, you don't tell them that. They'll change the way they look at you. They'll think low of you. But this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And the moment that you shut up the testimony, stop telling the people what God has done. You see, Spurgeon says of this, or actually Adam Clark, how blind were these men not to perceive that he who had raised him after he had been dead for four days to raise him again though they had slain him a thousand times. Though Lazarus would be killed, didn't they know that the king lives? Didn't they know that if Jesus lives, Jesus can resurrect the dead? You see, the power of the resurrection is that Jesus, even though he died, he resurrected from the dead, and he lives forevermore. So even though death comes your way, you have confidence in Jesus that you will resurrect from the dead. Even though they slain you a thousand times, do you not know that if you have Jesus, you'll be raised again from the dead? That's why you cannot set up the testimony. That's why for long live the king. All right. Make way for the king. Serve king and country. The king will live forever. Long live the king. We live for a cause that's greater than us. If we give our lives, we know that we will be raised again to life in Jesus. And the reason for our greatest hope is that the king is coming. The Bible says it this way, Philippians 2, verse 9 through 11. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, there's coming a day that we will have to acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We will have to acknowledge that Jesus is King. You and I are going to ten, attend a coronation ceremony in the heavens where every single person who has ever existed will have to recognize that Jesus Christ is just, that Jesus Christ is Savior, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and he's the King of Kings. And this is how it will happen. Near the throne, this is after the 1,000 years, are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked as a branch from the burning have followed their Savior with a deep, intense devotion. Notice this. On that day, in Jesus' throne, when he's getting crowned, nearest to him, nearer than the angels, nearest to him, closest to him on that coronation day the people that are closest to him look who they are were, who were once zealous in the cause of Satan those who worked for Satan those who turned their backs on God those that rejected his law those are the ones that are going to be closest to him but guess what happened those that were zealous but who plucked as brands from the burning have followed their Savior with deep, intense devotion. The people that are closest to God on his day of coronation are the people that messed up, are the people that have broken lives, are the people that were in addiction, are the people that went to jail, are the people that had problems. But by the mercy of God, they were picked from the burning. They were snatched up from death. They heard the good news. They believed in Jesus and followed the Savior with a deep, intense devotion. Those are the people that are closest to him. 
the people that have the mark of Jesus on their lives. Then next are those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity. Those who honored the law of God when, Christian, when the Christian world declared it void. And the millions of all the ages who were martyred for their faith. Also in that coronation are those that died for the cause of Christ. Those that stood firm even though the heavens fell. And beyond is a great multitude which no man can number of all nations, all kindreds, and all people and tongues. Before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with the white robe and palms in their hands. Their warfare is ended, their victory won. And Jesus is going to get crowned. I thank God that those of us that should not be there will get the best seat. We'll get the best seat. Look at this. Look at this. As the redeemed have beheld the power and malignity of Satan, they have seen as never before that no power but that of Christ could have made them conquerors. In all that shining throng, there are none to ascribe salvation to themselves as if they have prevailed by their own power and goodness. In the presence of the assembled inhabitants of the earth and heaven, the final coronation of the Son of God takes place place. You see, when we get there, and everyone who has ever lived is standing before the King of Kings, and all will see on that day the crown of heaven be put on his head. Those that will live with the King forevermore, those that have accepted eternal life through the Son of Jesus, it will not be because they were good. It will not be because they kept the law so faithfully. It will not be because they were perfect. It is because they have believed in the one who was perfect. It's because they have believed in the one who has kept the law with them. It had, it's the one who has made them righteous. It's the one who has washed them from the, with the blood of the lamb. It's the one who has washed them from all sin. They have believed in him. And they will realize that Satan was too powerful for them to conquer him on, his own, on their own. And then, in the presence of all who have ever lived, the inhabitants, the earth and heaven, and the final coronation of the Son of God takes place. The crown gets on his head, and he will reign forevermore. We probably were not at the coronation of King Charles III, but I guarantee you, each of us will be at the coronation of the Son of God. The question is, which side of the kingdom will you be on? You'll be on the side that says, make way for the king. And as the king is coming, once again, you begin to prepare the way for Jesus to come again like John the Baptist. You begin to prepare the way. You begin to tell the people, hey, the king is coming. Get ready. The king is coming. We're going home. Or will you be the type of people that gets in the way of the king, that stops the progress of God's people, that stops God's kingdom from growing? Will you serve God? and country, will you grow the kingdom of God when God tells you to do something and you, move, you do it, when God says move the stones in your neighborhood and you move them, when you go to extra lengths so that people can know the good news of salvation, and even if in this life you die, long lives the king, and if he lives, he can resurrect you and I. Let me tell you, don't be deceived. king is coming. So if the king is coming, will you not serve him? Let's stand and let's sing our closing song. Make me a servant.